What Bree just said, uh, we're doing this really because we had to reschedule the Hall of Fame and football reunion uh, that was supposed to take place. And we have Hall of Fame honorees. And we also have uh, two STAG Award recipients. And the STAG Award rec recognizes alumni who participated in athletics at Pacific and achieved distinction in their professional lives. So with that, I'm going to briefly take you through the panelists that are here today. And we're going to start with the Hall of Fame inductees. And I'll begin with Daryl Hobbs from the class of 1991. Daryl was drafted by the Raiders, uh, played for the Raiders 1993 to 96, also played for the Saints, Seahawks, and Chiefs, played in the CFL, the XFL, the original XFL. Uh, and uh, uh, Daryl, are you still coaching in Houston? Yeah, I'm coaching at the Pro Vision Academy. We're back-to-back -back, uh, state champions. This year we were runner-ups. We finished a little short, but we're, we're doing some good things. Congratulations on that. Uh, Daryl is in the top 10 in multiple categories. At Pacific holds a single season record for touchdowns, receiving touchdowns, receiving yards, receptions, and all purpose yards. Uh, Greg Koperick, a defensive back class of 1990, a Hall of Fame inductee, an All American in 1988, three time all conference selection, uh, played most of the 1989 season with a broken wrist, but despite that, was named the team MVP that year. So, hello to Greg. Uh, the other Hall of Fame inductee is the, uh, the football team. I guess it's not a person. It's the football teams, uh, 1972 and 1973. Uh, those teams coached by the late Chester Caddis, represented here by assistant coach Walt Harris. Uh, those teams combined for a 750 winning percentage going 8-3 in 1972, 7-2-1 seven, in 1973. The 1972 team had the most wins by any Pacific football team in the Division 1A era. The Stag Award honorees, uh, Carl Kammerer, defensive end linebacker, class of 1960. A local kid attended Lodi High one year at Delta and went on to be selected after Pacific, the uh, 22nd overall pick in the 1960 NFL draft by the 49ers. Uh, he has raised $375,000 for the Walter Reed Society, and we'll get into Carl's story as we move on tonight. And last but not least, uh, Tafa Jefferson, offensive tackle, 1997 uh, class of 1997, uh, signed with the Bears as an undrafted free agent after playing at Pacific. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Amata Senior Care, providing in-home care and assisted living options to seniors. Also a CNA, a certified nurse's assistant, and he's focused on caring for patients with dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. And Amata Senior Care is the official sponsor and exclusive in-home provider for former NFL players, coaches, and staff members. So that's who we have with us today. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Pleasure to have you all here watching as well. Love our Tuesday chats and, and glad this one's going till about 530. I'm going to go around the horn here and I'm going to preface it by saying this. I was never at Pacific when football was, was taking place. Uh, 1995, I believe, the last year of football at uh, UOP. Am, am I right? You can, so anybody can correct me on that, but it was 95. I see Tim, Tim nodding, so... Fatafa, uh, show him your shirt you got there. So we yeah, understand. Fatafa, you, you had something there. Was, uh, the, uh, un undefeated since 95. There you go. <laughs> I, need, <laughs> I need one of those unscored shirts, by the way. And unscored upon. Yes, that's right. I need one of those shirts. Um, so for me, Football Pacific was a little bit like studying Latin in junior high. Like I, at the time, I didn't know why I was doing it. It's like this language doesn't even exist anymore. But the more you go on, the more you realize that there are certain elements of the Latin language that are screaming at you in the everyday English language that we use. So there's still great importance, even though that language isn't, isn't used anymore. I, I would give that analogy to Pacific football, where it's no longer in existence, but there are so many great elements of it that echo uh, throughout football today, be it in the NFL or wherever. Um, so that's what Pacific football kind of kind of means to me as somebody that has just heard about it in the you know decade plus that I've spent at Pacific. I want to go around the horn and ask you all what Pacific football means to you, and I'll start with Coach Harris. Uh, it was um, my high school coach Tom McCormick played at Pacific, and he was a great great football player. I think in 1950 51 that era. And then he was my uh, high school coach, my sophomore and junior year of high school. And uh, he left after my junior year and went straight to the NFL and then ended up coaching for Vince Lombardi and coached coach a running back, which is a position he played. And basically he told me that Pacific would be a good place for me to go to school. 
And so I did. I went, had gone to junior college. And um, so Pacific became so much more than I ever dreamed it was going to be. I had no idea what it was going to be. So um, thank you for Coach McCormick. Daryl, how about you? Uh, what does Pacific football mean to you as, a, as an alum? Every, you know, UOP was everything for me. You know, Coach Harris was my coach. Uh, they recruited me from Santa Monica College. I, too, went to junior college. And, uh, you know, it gave me the opportunity to be able to stay home, you know, in California. Uh, and uh, it opened up a lot of avenues for me. Uh, and I'm very grateful for Coach Harris and University of Pacific for allowing me the opportunity to uh, be a part of uh, such a great institution. How about Greg Koperick? You know, UOP means the, the football program was just the relationships I uh, made as, with the players and the friendships and uh, they're still to this day. So it's most about the relationships I made with my teammates and the friends and, the, you know, I got married at UOP. So it was fun and it was a great time. And uh, it's mostly about the relationships of your teammates and uh, the bonds you create. How about uh, Tafa? I, I have to agree with Greg. I mean, uh, I, I just really cherish the days that uh, we would be back on campus and and having football games, and it was such a, a, a nice, uh, tight-knit community. And even to this day, my business partner, who's played quarterback for us at UOP, he, he's, he's a best friend, and, and uh, I just, you know, we still keep in contact with some of the guys, but not, not as much as we should, but uh, just lifelong friendships, you know. So I really appreciate what the, the university has had created for us and continues to, to, to support, you know, in, in hosting – uh, events like this. So I, I'm really grateful to be a Tiger. Last but not least, Carl Kammerer. Hey, speaking of Tigers, <laughs> I keep in touch with Tigers all the time. In fact, uh, some of our older American Tigers, like Coach Moose Myers, uh, I telephone him occasionally and chat about uh, the days of yesteryear and all of the great football players that we had. You know, there were, uh, I think, 11 guys off of that. If you were on the team at 57 through 60, uh, 11 guys went into the NFL. The other coach I keep in touch with, uh, who now is in uh, assisted living, so I don't get to talk to him directly, but uh, George Dixon. And uh, he'll be 99, I think, in either August or September or sometime around there. And uh, Coach Myers is... Uh, probably 95 or so anyway but keeping in touch with uh my comrades is all good stuff willie hector uh joe malpasuto tom flores i've got a picture of dick bass let me see it's on my wall right here uh, okay there they are in 1958 this is a week before the cal game and Dick and I used to commiserate on the phone a lot, but he's been gone for at least 10 years. Anyway, so the fellowships and the relationships are just powerful good. And I'm suggesting I'm 83 and I'm middle-aged. And so I'll be around for a while. I love Pacific. Amen. Love the answer. Uh, I'm going to delve into it here a little bit with the Stag Award uh, recipients. And what we're going to share football stories as we go and, and certainly talk with everybody. But uh, Carl and Tafa are the Stag Award recipients. And again, the Stag Award recognizes uh, alums who have gone on to do great things in the community, and, and both of these gentlemen have. Um, I'm going to start here with Carl. How much of what you went on to do in the community, and again, you have gone on to raise $375,000 for the Walter Reed Society. How much of your, your goodwill in the community was rooted in what you learned both at Pacific and growing up in the Central Valley? Uh, first of all, uh, Amos Alonzo Stagg was my coach in 1956. I, was, uh, I spent a year at Stockton College and he was an advisory coach there. And what he did was coaching the kicking game. I took punting lessons from him every single day, not because I wanted to be a punter, but because he's who he is. Uh, it's, he's just an amazing person, uh, 70 active years of coaching. Of course, he's uh, a strong Christian or was a strong Christian. And those principles guided everything that he did, including giving back huge amounts to society. 
Uh, he had a 70 active year of coaching. And I've got a grandson just graduating uh, next week from Susquehanna University. And uh, Amos Alonzo Stagg and his son were co-coaches there during the uh, 40s. He was at Pacific before then and then Stockton College. And so I learned a lot from him in what to do in extra things for improving life for some of our fellow Americans. And uh, the same thing at Pacific, uh, the, the consideration was, okay, so you're here and you've got a great education going, uh, what else are you gonna do in life? And I thought about that. I had a great, uh, as, as all of us did, uh, you know, scholarship at Pacific, full ride scholarship. And so I learned early on that I would give back in terms of my ability to encourage others to improve people's societal uh, activities, be involved in things like the uh, wounded veterans and the Walter Reed Society. And that number is now over $400,000. Wow. And the biggest number for me is the fact that uh, more than 200 wounded veterans on the golf course is what I've arranged for. I typically take uh, myself and three other former NFL players to uh, golf tournaments all the way from Buffalo, New York, through all of the states down to Amelia Island, Florida. And uh, that number is uh, 200, just a little over 200 wounded veterans. So it's really cool. And I get great, great rewards by them patting me on the back for, you know, they're being gracious for the fact that we've taken them out of either the hospital setting or their uh, whatever living situation they're in and bring them to a quality golf course. Typically it's a private country club and uh, holy moly, they are so thankful to be able to focus on trying to hit that little pilota from point A to point B and their focus is on that instead of the afflictions that they might be dealing with on any particular day. So, yep, learned a little bit in both so, both schools. Uh, you retired in 1969. You started working in the government. When did you uh, really get involved in working with wounded veterans and, and what prompted that for you? Well, actually, that's, that's a great question. Uh, when I was a uh, defensive end for the Washington Redskins in 1967, I was asked to come to Walter Reed uh, Medical Center and address the wounded veterans in what was then, it still is there, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Red Cross building. And it's a little amphitheater and there were probably somewhere near a hundred uh, wounded veterans, all men in those days. And so on the day of that, uh, that evening for a Christmas celebration was Mayor Walter Washington uh, two members of Congress that I can't recall, uh, Mamie Eisenhower and myself. And so they all had functional things to do. And my job was simply to tell, uh, you know, a handful of funny NFL stories about people they know. And uh, so I, I was going to do that. They said, we're going to have you here for a max of 15 minutes. So I told my first story. And when I came to my uh, you know, the punchline, I hit that guy and I'm looking out at the audience expecting great response. There was nothing. Uh, I'm convinced they were, you know, arms folded and just looking and saying, here's this big dude and he's here and I got to stay here and he's going to be gone. And so what's the big deal? Well, the guy that introduced me, his name was John. I can't remember his, first, his, his second name. But uh, he was in a wheelchair, and he had both legs gone just above the knees. And he was rocking back and forth on the stage. And any time I walked by near him with the microphone, there was a squeak coming from that action of him rocking back and forth. And so it amplified throughout the auditorium. And so at one point I turned to him and I said, John, if you don't stop that man, I'm gonna turn that thing over. The guys snickered, the guys broke a little laughter. They, you know, they loosened up a little bit. So as I say, I was supposed to be there 15 minutes. I, 
I jumped down off the dais. First, it dismissed that very important uh, group of people, and they all left. And I got down uh, on the floor with all of the guys and started off asking them, uh, you know, where they're where they're from, uh, what branch of service they're in, anything they wanted to say. And and the first guy fell right into line like we organized it completely. And uh, he said, North Carolina, sir. I said, well, does the name of, uh, oh, yes, the name. <laughs> oh, who is the guy that played in North Carolina State, played for the LA Rams quarterback? And for Roman Gabriel. There you go. I said, did the name Roman Gabriel mean anything to you? And he jumped up and he started going statistical stuff that he knew. And I said, I'm going to tell you a couple things about him that you don't know. So I would relate a story from my actually playing against Roman Gabriel. And we did that on several occasions. He and I played against each other. And uh, so I'd go to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. And then somebody would remind me of a story and I would tell that. Here's the point. I was there for over two hours. I went through everybody, talked to everyone like that. And here is the coup de gras. I learned that at that time, there's something happening. I don't know what they did yesterday. I don't know what they were involved in, possibly tomorrow. But right now, they're stumping and cooking. And their focus is elsewhere besides the affliction that they have. So that started it all. And uh, there you go. It's fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing the story, Carl. Uh, I'm going to move over to Tafa now, who is the class in 1997. Uh, can you bridge for us, Tafa, the, the time between the end of your playing career to going on to be a CNA and, and, and getting Amada Senior Care off the ground and, and what transpired between the, the time you stopped playing and, and that time? Yeah, well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, um, pay my condolences to uh, Chuck Shelton. Uh, may he rest in peace. He, he passed uh, not too long ago. Um, and, 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 you know, um, Chuck Shelton was the head coach there. I played under Chuck Shelton. And uh, he was one of the primary reasons why I decided to go to University of Pacific. Um, Chuck Shelton really instilled uh, the values of – of, of having high character, being accountable, being on time every time, those types of things that uh, we as young men needed. You know, I, I was a junior college transfer coming in and um, he brought me in with open arms and, and he was a great mentor. So uh, a football coach, he was a wonderful coach, but more than anything, he instilled character and he, he taught us uh, what it was, uh, he taught us to be young gentlemen. And so, uh, for that, I'm very grateful for to, to be coached by Chuck. Um, but just to answer your question, after I, I, ha I tell everybody I had a quick cup of coffee in the NFL, and, and I bounced around a little bit, but immediately after uh, 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 getting cut and going home, uh, I found myself, okay, I, I'm out of school. You know, I, I knew I wanted to be in the healthcare field, and, but I didn't know quite what to do with myself. So uh, my, my dream was to be a hospital administrator. And, um, and one day, my, my mother was a caregiver. And one day when I came home, she was home for her lunch break. And uh, I said, you know, I, I really would love to go work in a hospital. Um, I, I've got a business degree. You know, I, 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 I studied a little bit in marketing. And, and I took the entrepreneurship course uh, uh, at University of Pacific. And that was another thing that drew me to a uh, UOP. And I remember her telling me plain as day, she said, why don't you start your own company? So essentially that week I did, I started my own business. I leaned back on all the lessons and, and the things that I learned in school at, at, uh, at uh, UOP. And I started my company. It was a home-based business. And for 10 years, I, I worked uh, extremely hard uh, focusing in on, on just delivering great care uh, serving people during their time of need. And it was a community outreach. It was a way for me to generate jobs in my community. It was a way for me to serve uh, seniors and allow them to age in place and really help out the sons and daughters uh, uh, that, that we served. And so uh, I, I'm a people-oriented guy. I love being around people. So marketing was my, was my stick. Um, uh, and uh, again, it was just, it just came naturally for me. So I grew that 
for about 10 years on my own. Um, but it was, it was never going to be a, a, a massive business that I could scale. And I realized that because I was working long hours, 15, 16 hour days. And, and I loved it. You know, I, I could have done it, you know, uh, you know, t- till the day is long, but I knew that there was, you know, I was called to, to really grow my business and serve other people, serve more people. Um, and I got reacquainted. I, I bumped back into uh, my college quarterback, Chad, who went to UOP. Uh, he was working a, pharma- a pharmaceutical job and I convinced him to come join me. And we did that in, uh, we did that in about 2006, 2007 grew the business and so now we're in, in 43 states and we have uh, several thousand employees and, and, and life is good and we're helping to, to drive jobs in the community and we're on the front lines of this uh, pandemic here and we're doing really well. Awesome. How about getting involved in the NFL? What was, what was the genesis of that? Obviously you, you did get the cup of coffee in the NFL but connecting your business to the NFL, what was that process like? Well, it's interesting, you know, uh, the NFL is a very, very difficult um, uh, account to, 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 to get, you know, I, and believe it or not, um, I just cold called them. I, I you know, I, I'm on their alumni um, uh, message boards. They send out, you know, benefit packages to the alumni. And I responded to um, an ad that came across my inbox and was talking about long-term care insurance. Now, don't sell long-term care insurance, but if you guys do not have a long-term care insurance policy, I would strongly recommend you look into it because long-term care insurance will pay for your health care costs. And so um, anyhow, they were offering this benefit. I responded. I emailed the, the president of the NFL Alumni Association. I hopped on a plane with Chad. We went out there, pitched them, and told them why we'd be uh, the best company for the NFL. And believe it or not, they believed us. <laughs> And uh, we, we've had that account for several several years now, and uh, we have a wonderful working relationship with the NFL. We take great pride in taking care of the players, and you know, it's it's also a way for me to give back. You know, a lot of these guys are, are having a lot of challenges as they transition out of football, and you know, I hearken back to a lot of the lessons that were that were instilled with me. You know, it's you know, uh, Carl t- touched on it. What are you going to do with yourself when when the game's over? And um, if you don't spend a lot of time thinking about your professional life or how you're going to age in place and, and, and setting your family up to be successful in retirement by augmenting the cost of care through using vehicles like insurance, it, it can be very difficult for people to make that transition. So for me, I take great pride in helping a lot of the alumni make that transition uh, during some of their tough years. Yeah, I can tell your uh, your enthusiasm is effusive and, uh, and good for you for for doing all that and getting that off the ground and having the foresight to, to go to the NFL and, and believe in what you're doing. Uh, I want to get into some some football now with, with both Tafa and, and Carl, and then we're going to talk with our Hall of Fame inductees. We'll bring them in and weave in a lot of the football. But Tafa, uh, your most memorable moment at Pacific, what, what was it? Oh, well, I mean – we had some very memorable moments at Pacific, but I remember distinctively uh, we played, it was a home game against Oregon state and we beat the pants off of Oregon state. And I believe we, we probably ran 14 traps in that game and they could not stop it. And uh, just the trash talking that happens between the line, between the line of scrimmage, it was one of, one of my more memorable games and uh, when you can run the score up on a Pac-10 uh, team, at the time they were Pac-10, it was a lot of fun. So, Carl, how about you, your most memorable Pacific moment? Well, quite fortunately, I think I have a, a number of memorable moments at Pacific, uh, but one that stands out is a game at Stag Memorial Stadium where uh, <laughs> Iowa State came to town. And uh, let me see, uh, yeah, is, the 83-year-old brain is not functioning totally here. I was going to name the two running backs uh, that Iowa State had. But anyway, in that day, um, holy moly, number 77 play in middle linebacker. It's half, you know the number. Half it to, yeah, it was – happened to uh, make 30, 33 individual tackles, 
No, that's not right. 17 individual tackles and 16 assists. So I jumped on 30, whatever that number is. <laughs> you know, just uh, had a great, great day. They, the guy that was in front of me when I went over to play the 5-4, the linebacker on the right side in front of the offensive guard, when he needed help from his tackle, he was going to pull. And when he needed help from his tackle – to block me while he ran off to do something else, he would yell, fist! Oh, come on. And so I first saw that happen. So I sneaked up on the line of scrimmage and uh, zipped through. And Tom Watkins is a running back. He played 10 years for uh, Detroit. Uh, you know, sneaked on through there and made a solo tackle. The next time I hear him yell fist, he makes an exaggerated sound. And so I say, okay, eh, something weird is happening here. And so he pulls to the left, they toss it to Watkins out to the right. And so I just run out and make the tackle individually, you know, so that wasn't a very smart uh, player there, but certainly remember that. The, lad, the other is a fabulous game against uh, college, I mean, against University of California. Joe Cap was their uh, quarterback. He was an All-American in 1958. Our All-American was Dick Bass, great running back. And uh, in that game, of course, he's the left halfback. I'm the left guard. Uh, I pull and he follows right behind. And he said, he gave me a lesson that no coach ever did. And he said, now, Carl, on that, when you turn up on the uh, upfield, if the linebacker is right there coming in from your left, and if he's at a step from us, you got to take him. If it's a step and a half, I got him. And so he would scoot up next to me, and the guy would run into me, and I'd continue on down the field to make a block downfield. Here's what he told me. He said, as soon as you clear the line, don't look for anybody. Just run as fast as you can in a straight line to the goal. I'll bring him to you. <laughs> Zig, and he'd zag, and, you know. It'd be true. He'd bring him right to us. And so he gained, uh, I think it was 212 yards that day. And we whooped Cal 24, 20. And they, uh, I believe they had two losses that year, one against us. And then they lost in the uh, Rose bowl, I think against Michigan. So those are a couple of great ones. Sounds like the brain is working pretty good, Carl. I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty vivid memories. Uh, I want to go around the horn now and ask about everybody's most vivid Pacific memory or favorite one. And Greg, I'll, I'll go with you first. Sure. Hey, um, I can't think of any specific games, but I can only think of the good times. And Coach Harris and Bob Cope, after every game we would win, and unfortunately we didn't win as many as we'd like to, but standing up on the – you remember this, Coach Harris? You'd stand up on the training table in the locker yeah. room. Sure I do. Yep, that was good times. I sing the fight song, get all fired up. It good, was great. That was the best. I enjoyed that. Just singing the fight song. Do you want to sing the fight song? I mean, I'll <laughs> <laughs> We've done it in the basketball games in the locker room with Coach Stoudemire this year, and uh, that's right. You you guys were at Long Beach, right? Yeah, I yeah. Was, I was so, busy on the radio, so I didn't I didn't get to say hi to you guys, but I heard all about it afterwards. And I'll tell but, you, I'll tell you this: everybody loved it. The whole team loved it. Did they? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that those were the best times, right there. Just thinking about the friends and everything like that. Daryl, how about you? I think the the most memorable time I, I I can remember would probably be that game we went to Knoxville, Tennessee, Coach Harris, and I can remember coming out of the tunnel and seeing millions and millions of people up there. And I was like, oh my God, look at how many people are in these stands. And so as the game went on, of course, you know, it was a money game. We, we went to get, get shellacked. <laughs> so we, we ended up playing a pretty good game. We were competitive, but uh, all I can remember was me and, and Gordon Jones, we, we were at halftime, we, we kept saying to each other, this game is such a big game. It's gonna be on TV. We want to get close to Coach Harris. Wherever Coach Harris is, when, we, when he's running around, let's get close to Coach so we can be in the pictures. So me and Gordon, we have, I have this picture in my office to this day of me and Gordon standing close to Coach Harris. He has his suit jacket on and he's running out the tunnel. We're right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Coach Harris, you remember that one? I remember coming out of the tunnel. I, I had left there to come to Pacific. So I, I knew a little bit about the uh, number of fans that would be at the game. They were very, very long. <laughs> but uh, I did not know about Daryl getting some pictures. I didn't know that. Well, now you know. <laughs> now you know years later. Uh, how about you, your favorite memory with Pacific football? Coach Harris. You know, I was there three different times. One as a player and a not a very good one. Two as assistant coach. And I was very lucky because well, I was around a lot of good coaches and good, good, good players. And I was lucky enough to be a part of those two teams, the 72 and 73 teams. And the last one was a head coach. So it was, there was a lot of, a lot of great memories. Um, I think what's, what really probably is most excited to me is when uh, I was able to be the head coach at my alma mater. And, you know, we've been struggling. So I went, I, I gave up kind of the um, Tennessee type of job to go back to Pacific in a way to say thank you for them recruiting me and giving me uh, at the time the friends that I've got the relationships I got and the memories that I have, and then the opportunity to lead the team and try to lead us to the promised land or, or a winning season or whatever it might be. So um, it, it's all mixed up in all those memories. Coach Harris, I'm going to stick with you and, and ask for your thoughts on how, how Pacific became such a football factory in terms of churning out all these great minds. I mean, going back to, to coach Stagg, but, you know, it, it continued to churn out guys like like Pete Carroll and, and Hugh Jackson and John Gruden, and those are just the notable names. I mean, there's so many others that I'm not mentioning, but how did Pacific become this incubator for that? I think because um, most of the kids that went there were pissed off about having to go there. And they they wanted to show that they were better than they, than, than they were, the respect that they had gotten in recruiting. You know, so I, I think the kids that go to Pacific were really, really hungry to try to prove that they were, they could play on the same field with other good football teams and other good football players. And um, it, it came out all over with the guys I know that I played with, you know, and plus we were lucky, man. We, we, had, uh, we had a really good offensive coach, uh, Doug Scoville, who was our head coach. And then we had a guy named Buddy Ryan. Can you guys believe, just in my, my little lifetime, I played for Tom McCormick, who was a running back coach for the Green Bay Packers during the, the uh, Ice Bowl, coach for Vince Lombardi. He coached Jim Taylor, Paul Horn, and you guys may not remember those guys. And then my senior year, I'm an outside linebacker in a 4-4 defense, eight-man front, and Buddy Ryan comes in to be in the defensive coordinator. He didn't know our name. That was our goal was to get him to learn our name. He always, he always knew our number, you know, our jersey number. The goal was for him to remember your name. Of course, that didn't ever happen. I was over on that. But what a great opportunity at a, at a school to be around those kinds of people. And, it, and basically is the reason why I became a, a – I uh, pursued that profession as well, is to try to give back – some of the great things that I felt those, those two coaches gave to me and to my teammates. I think now is the appropriate time to ask you a question we got from the gallery here for Coach Harris. Uh, the question is, how did working with Coach Caddis and Coach Cope influence your coaching philosophy? Tremendously. Tremendously. Um, what happened was, you know, Homer Smith became the, Ken Blue was a defensive coordinator who was a secondary coach when Buddy Ryan was there at Pacific. Okay, so then Ken Blue was at Pacific and then did a great job. Everybody loves Ken Blue, everybody did. And then, um, um, so what, what, basically I'm, I'm, I'm losing my track. Give me, give me my uh, track again, I feel like I'm- Oh, how did, how did working with Coach Caddis and Coach Cope influence okay. your coaching philosophy? And so, so Coach Caddis was a defense coordinator, I was a secondary coach, because I came in under Coach Blue and he was there two weeks. I gave up a, a, a $9,000 high school teaching job and coaching job at my alma mater to come back to Pacific to be a football coach. Well, I was there two weeks 
as secondary coach, and Ken Blue had got his two dreams. He wanted to become a head coach in the NFL. Um, he wanted to be head coach in college, and he wanted to get he wanted to coach in the NFL. So he took the NFL job. So I, so then Homer Smith came in. He did not mix with the Pacific type of people, and but Chester did. And Chester um, was defense coordinator. You know, um, the one thing you didn't want with Chester for him to uh, bow his eye, kind of close one eye and him kind of squint at you because he knew you were in trouble. Because he, he's a big dude, man. But Bobby Cope was my mentor. And, uh, you know, I followed him as a head coach at Pacific. Um, he did not have some of the same opportunities that I had. And he, but he, he coached me uh, as a secondary coach. He taught me so much about defense. And uh, we were, as I'm going to talk when we get to it, and the 72, 73 teams were outstanding on defense. Outstanding. And Bobby had a tremendous amount. He's a defense coordinator, tremendous amount to making that happen. Yeah, I definitely am going to circle back here in a little bit to the, uh, the teams that we're honoring with this, with this chat, the 72 and the 73 teams. I want to go to Carl uh, real quick. And, and since we're talking about coaching, Carl, you're, you have an unbelievable line to one of the great football minds in, in Amos Alonzo Stagg. And you could shed some light on what it, was, what it was about Coach Stagg that made him so great and, and such a, a revolutionary. Well, the main thing about him was that there was never, ever anything negative in his thought or what he ever said. And here's an example. It's just, and you coaches would <laughs> would relate to this as well. And that is, uh, he, he would stand with his back to the line and watch the field goal attempts in practice go up over his head and check whether it went right in the middle or just where it went and critique the, uh, the performance of our practice. And then the second team came in, this is at Stockton college. The second team came in and I'll not mention the guy's name because it would be uh, nasty news, but I know who it is. Uh, he centered the ball and stumbled forward and hit Mr. Stagg right in the middle of his back with his head down with, uh, the center's head was down and knocked him to the ground. And so Coach Hall runs over and starts to help him up. And Mr. Stagg waves him off. And he stands up and turns to everybody and he says, and now, boys, if we all hit like that on Friday, we can't help but win. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... As a coach, you would you would castigate the guy who did that. You might castrate the guy who did that. You might I don't know, but uh, so. And by the way, it was he was he was only two weeks back from that is Amos Alonso Stay. He was only two weeks back from uh, having a tumor removed behind his eyes. So he was all bandaged up like the fife and drum corps, you know, picture that you've all seen, and so it made it even you know, even more so. And here he is at 94 years young. And so it's it, you know, he would, he, he had that uh, ability to make everything positive. So I don't have, don't have let me see if you can see, see if that. you can see that. Uh, here is uh, something that hung in my mother's kitchen for 50 years. She passed away about 10 years ago, and, and so I made a frame to go around it as I did the frames of the other things that are here. But it's the story of Amos Alonzo Stagg, or my own self, actually. And here's what it says. It's a picture of a rose, a single rose, and it says at the top, I can complain because rose bushes have thorns, or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Bingo. It's a great perspective, and that's a great recollection. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have another coach. Speaking of, uh, of coaches, we're going to answer another question here for, for Daryl Hobbs. Uh, we go from Amos Alonzo Stagg to Mike Ditka. Uh, somebody would like to know, when you were in New Orleans, what were your interactions with Mike Ditka like? Mike, uh, Mike you know, Mike was always on the other side of the field. He kind of 
kept toward himself. Toward himself, he never he never said anything to you unless he had to. Uh, he sort of just sit back and watch practice. Uh, he didn't didn't he didn't do too much. But when he did do something, it was you knew. Okay, it was either his way or the highway. And you know, Mike, he's old school. Uh, you didn't do too much talking to him. You know, he'd let you know how, what he wanted you to do, and and that was it. And and if you couldn't get it done, he was going to find somebody to do it. Uh, it's just that me coming from the Raiders and Al Davis, it was two different worlds. You know, we we got pretty much whatever we wanted, whatever we needed. That was that was the Raiders. Well, when you went when you go to to New Orleans, and they're putting bags over their heads and they're trying to you know <laughs> get things going. Uh, they want to. They want to know where your socks are when you want more socks or stuff like that. You know, it's, it's just a different world. But we were trying. We were trying to get Mike, you know, to to see what what we were what we needed, and he was coming along. And uh, but he was just old school. It was Iron Mike and uh, you know Walter Payton, uh, Willie Gold, uh, those old guys. That that was instilled in him. And so uh, we we didn't do too much talking. We just practiced and performed. <laughs> Those were interesting days for, for Iron Mike. That was Ricky Williams, right? That was when he, he basically yeah, traded Rick, 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 Ricky Williams. Rick, yeah, Ricky Williams was there. Jim Everett, he had just got Jim Everett out. Uh, we had Heath Schuler as a quarterback. Uh, he had, Mike had pretty much cleared everyone out of there. Uh, uh, Mike Haynes was gone. Torrance Small, they got, got them all out of there. He brought me in. He brought a guy in by uh, Thrill Hill, went to the University of Miami, and, and uh, Andre Hastings for Pittsburgh. It was us three. While I have you here, I might as well keep it with you. I mentioned and ran down your resume briefly. You played, you're drafted by the Raiders, but you played for the Saints, Seahawks, and Chiefs. You also played in the CFL and the XFL. Uh, the XFL kind of started getting going again, and then obviously the COVID stuff happened and it, it got stopped in its tracks. But I want to ask you, do you feel like there is room for an institution other than the NFL to make a, a, a big impression, a big splash in the world of professional football? Having you having, I know the CFL is kind of well-established, but, you know, in terms of the XFL and things like that? Honestly, I think it is. The XFL, you know, the more platforms for people to, to showcase the, their talents, the better. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play when it originated uh, with uh, Vince McMahon and, and, and uh, Dick Butkus. He used to come out to the practices. Uh, and I was also fortunate enough to meet uh, the uh, last commissioner. He was here at the, the Houston game, and we were sitting up in the box talking uh, Mr. Luck. And so... Uh, uh, I think, you know, the platforms, if you, if you get the platforms out there uh, and, and allow the kids to showcase themselves, it helps the NFL because, you know, the NFL only carries so many people. And, uh, you know, the, uh, football players want to play football. And uh, when I was in the XFL, I enjoyed playing football. And uh, it, it was a means of me just to continue doing what I love to do. And, and, I, and I, uh, I love it. And so, yeah, I think it is. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I want to go to Greg Koperick, who, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask about the evolution of the game here, but I'm going to preface it by saying that, that you played most of the 1989 season with a broken wrist. Uh, despite that, you were named team MVP. I, I don't think that would happen quite as much, you know, around these times now. I, I think that's kind of a throwback, but uh, what was it like for you going through that, that 1989 season with that injury and, and going on to perform as well as you did? What was that like to gut it out? Well, uh, it happened, I think, the fourth game of the year. We were playing San Jose State. It was like the last play of the game. Um, I dove for somebody and broke my arm, and I knew it was my last year. So it wasn't that bad of a break. Uh, I just had to get clearance from the doctors. I was driving to the Bay Area trying to get this 49er team doctor to clear me. And Coach Harris was uh, very supportive. And um, I was able to go through the training staff and just get like a brace made. But you don't realize it till you go out on the field with a break in your arm, try to tackle somebody. It's pretty tough. And the pain was tough. As You just got used to it. And I was able to finish out the season that way. Uh, it was my fifth year at Pacific. I was uh, came in in 85 with Bob Cope and uh, – had guys like Nick Holt and Eduardo and Hugh Jackson and Greg Murphy. Uh, so I, then I redshirted. So I, I had been there so long. I was like, look, I'm not going to end the year sitting on the sidelines. So um, it was just something I just chose to do. And uh, playing the position I did, it worked out. I wasn't able to do any returns or kicks or anything like that. So 
but um, it wasn't so bad. Do you think that playing with that type of injury is, is part of football, or do you think that it really needs to be evaluated and, and thought about comprehensively whether or not you should be injured and, and continue to play? Um, you know, if it's a head injury or something like that, obviously you don't want to do it. It was just a wrist, and it wasn't like it was going to snap again. I was going to be permanently disabled. So, um, and plus, I probably wasn't too smart at the time, and I was just ready to play. Um, so I just went out and did it. I got some cool pictures of that. It's in my uh, in my house. So it was, it, it was something I just chose to do to help the team through the season. And it's my last year. When you're a fifth year senior. And Daryl and uh, Carl and Coach Harris and, and everybody will attest to, you just want to play and finish out and do the best you can. Yeah, that feeling of invincibility goes away fast when you get into your 30s. Um, I had a question for you, Greg, uh, yeah. gallery. Uh, your impressions of playing Auburn your senior year. <laughs> Auburn, uh, Coach Harris remembers this. I remember going to the stadium the most, and there was like those old, you know, the – state police with the, the hats and it was really hot. It might have been Labor Day weekend. It was blazing hot, 95 degrees and humid. And, um, you know, at the time we just came back from playing Pitt the week before. So we traveled to Pitt, who was ranked 12th in the nation. They had Alex Van Pelt and a lot of really good players. We played them well. Oh, you know, we're hanging with them the whole game. We travel all the way back to Stockton. Now we're in Auburn the following week. I, I mean, Notre Dame wouldn't take on this type of uh, schedule. And uh, I remember getting there and just seeing the, you know, the state police and the fans. Uh, but I do recall one thing in the fourth quarter, we're getting blasted. The game was getting out of hand. They handed it off to a freshman running back. He just buried me. I made the tackle. I think I hung on and I got up and the PA announcer goes, that is our true freshman, 6'3", 220 pounder from, I don't know where, five star. And I go, that is their four string running back. So I told the guy, you need to come over to us and transfer. We'll give you the ball every down, man. And he laughed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was an education in how deep those teams are. But Pat Dye was the coach and uh, got to meet him. And uh, Coach Harris, you know, introduced me to him. It was a great time. Coach Harris, can you, uh, can you expand on that memory? Which, which memory? About going to Auburn? Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> you know, um, that was quite a schedule to open up at Pitt, which is really ironic. The fact that I end up going to Pitt as a coach, my, my first game as a head coach was against, was against Pitt was really quite ironic, but, but, um, for us to go to Auburn, I know when I was at Tennessee, man, you couldn't hear yourself think with the crowd that they have down there. And they also have some football players that Greg was alluding to, you know, Bo Jackson played there. Uh, he was he was big train and the little train. A kid who played for the Chargers. You know they had so many bemas that great football players. Um, I think the funniest thing I remember. Well, I'm not going to talk about that because that wouldn't be fair to the person. But it was it was just we were you know we just didn't have a chance. You know, and, and it's really the sad part about being at Pacific and not for the players so much because I know they love going to get that kind of competition, but, but putting us up. I, my first year we played, I think, 12 games, and eight of them were on the road, and seven of them we stayed over on Saturday night. So here I'm the head coach responsible for these guys. You know, you know how young people are in a strange community, you know, at Saturday night after a football game. It just it, – it just, uh, but it's what Pacific had to do in order to stay in business. Football hey, Coach Harris. I will tell you, when we stayed in Auburn, it was a dry town. That's all I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the don't, tell, don't ask me how I know that, but I remember it was a dry town. <laughs> uh, while, while we're going down memory lane, we do have a question for Coach Harris, and it pertains to the 1972 team. What are your remembrances of playing at LSU in 1972? Good memory, um, but I had some memories. Uh, when we're, uh, it was the second game. We played really well against Sonny Siskiller, who was a great quarterback for Washington. Okay. It was the, the game was tied 6-6 in the opener going into the fourth quarter. We ended up getting beat 13-6. Plus, we lost our quarterback, Carlos Brown, in that game. 
who had been um, for the uh, Homer Smith had been the 10th ranked quarterback. So we had to play a true freshman. So the next game, our true freshman quarterback is Bruce Keplinger. We're going to LSU. So we, we go to the airport in Stockton. I think we got a charter with, it might've been the only time or the last time we ever had a charter, but we're getting ready to get on the plane. I, and I go get me a sports illustrated and Burt Jones is the quarterback from LSU. He's on the cover of sports illustrated. That's who we're getting ready to go play. My, 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 that was unbelievable. I remember they would come running out. Of, they have a little door doorway coming out of the, in the end zone, and they'd come running out. I was talking to the DBs in that game. I was coaching DBs at the time. And, and then all of a sudden, they came running out, and I felt like I was inside of a jet engine. I, my lips were moving, but there was no way you could ever hear me. It was so loud the stadium was real high and so the the noise bounced back and forth it, it's a tremendous tremendous atmosphere to play football i saw a picture recently where steve spiro blocked the punt remember that have you seen that photo pop up i i remember it well um we we kicked off to them and stopped them in three downs you know and then um we had designed a pretty good block so we went in and Spike blocked it, you know, and so here we are, you know, the, the crowd got a lot, a lot quieter then, but um, <laughs> they, they end up, uh, they were superior. So they end up showing it, but it was, it was, plus the other thing they do at LSU, they put their, their tiger that's in a cage and bang the cage with uh, this, this, whatever they had and get them pissed off and have them growl. Shoot, man, these California boys. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that so yeah, we got Tiger King that. right there. Huh? You should have been filming the whole time, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, Tafa, uh, C. Miller says what's up, and he wants to know who does your decor. Oh, that's uh, that's my wife. That would be my wife. <laughs> Nice. We read That's all those books, great. right, Tafa? Tafa, you read all those books every day. I know you do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, Tafa, I'm going to keep it with you. What was it like, uh, you know, what was it like when the football program started to realize that it would be no longer uh, in 1995? You know, it's, it, it was an interesting time because I think uh, at, at that time, you know, we were more concerned with some of the players who, who were stuck like their sophomore, junior year. And unfortunately, they were some of the guys, some of the players were left behind their senior year. So it was a matter of them transferring and, and playing one year. So uh, my business partner was was one of those guys. He, he was unfortunately he didn't have the opportunity to tra transition to another school. However, you know, my young brother, Love, he, he played. Uh, uh, he played uh, at Pacific and um, ended up transitioning to Washington State. And, you know, it's – you talk about full circle. I had committed to Washington State, and at the last minute I took a trip to Pacific, and Coach Shelton talked me into committing to Pacific. And, um, and, and I went back to Washington State and said, hey, you know, you know we're getting two scholarships here. Would you guys match? And, and, and Wazoo told my brother that he was too small. So he ended up, when we dropped the program, Washington State was the first school to come take my brother, and they ended up going to the Rose Bowl the, the, the following year. So, you know, it was great to see a lot of the players transition out and do really well at a lot of the bigger schools. And so um, I, I was really proud to be affiliated with a lot of those players, and, and they, they, they were able to transition and do really well. But, you know, for me – I had a different mentality. Um, I, I she was sharing this with Tim earlier. Uh, my father was really impressing upon me, you know, to have uh, your, your plan B is really your plan A. Because uh, statistically speaking, a lot of guys are not going to get a shot to go to the NFL. And so for me, I was always one to put my school first. Um, I was really engaged in, in my courses. Um, and, and, you know, I've shared this with many people. I, I would go to my business school, uh, my classes, uh, and, and think, gosh, I'm so lucky to even be here, you know. And so for me, I was seizing the opportunity to learn as much as I could while I was there. And that was my way to to make sure that, you know, my, my manual labor wasn't for, for, for nothing, you know. So for me, I was always thinking it was a matter of time before I got injured. 
um, or something didn't go my way. And, and what was I going to do with myself afterwards? So for me, my plan B was my plan A. So I, I had a different perspective on things. So was there any kind of a mourning period for you when, when this became, you know, what it was with, with football ending? Or did you really just accept it in stride? Yeah, I accepted it in stride. For me, again, it, I was, you know, I was kind of one of the lucky guys, right? I wasn't expecting to get a shot, you know, on a roster with a team. And, you know, coming from a very small school like Pacific, it, it, it's very rare when that happened. And I think there were probably four or five of us that got shots at, at rosters. Um, but for me, I was a junior college transfer. So I had the opportunity to really uh, stay on campus, really buckle down with my school before I walked and, and get out of there. So I was in a unique situation where I knew I was going to land on a roster somewhere the following year, but I had one year to just work out and not have to, you know, uh, be obligated to work or anything. So uh, I, I was in a unique situation. I uh, have a question for Daryl. Uh, was it difficult for you to switch to wide receiver after playing quarterback? And do you feel the switch worked out for the best? It wasn't difficult at all. Uh, people don't know this, but in high school, I started out as a wide receiver. A uh, guy, guy by the name of Mark Rogers, who later went on to USC, was the quarterback. And he had a hard time throwing the football, so they switched me. Okay, and that was when I was in the 11th grade. So I, I, I've always played receiver. It's just that I really focused on quarterback when I, when I left high school and went to uh, junior college. And, of course, when I went to University Pacific, like I mentioned earlier, you know, me and Walt, we, we, had, that, we had to talk. You know, at the time, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an avenue for me to uh, play quarterback in the National Football League. And Walt told me, man, if you want to make a living in this game, you, you can do it playing wide receiver. And so – I made the switch and, and the rest was history. And, you know, if it, if it wasn't for me tagging along with another guy by Gary Calhoun on a Raider tryout, I don't know where I would be. Uh, and so I, I was just blessed to be in the right spot at the right time. And uh, it worked out for me. And, you know, the rest is history. I'm going to keep it with, <laughs> with Daryl and then I'm going to bounce over to Greg. Uh, sorry, Coach Harris, did you, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to say something about Daryl. Daryl, I had a nickname for Daryl. He had vacuum cleaner hands. In other words, he, <laughs> he used to just suck the ball, man. A ball just come right in his hands. He would be buried, you know. He had such great hands. And, and that in those days, it was a different deal, you know, for the young black quarterbacks. So that's why it's so great that Lamar uh, Jackson, you know, Russell Wilson, on and on and on. Uh, the quarterback from Kansas City, it's just so great that all those guys are doing well. And, and, and so now there's no talk about, well, because he's a black quarterback, you know. It, that has nothing to do with it anymore. It, it, can he play? You know, and I, I talked to Daryl a couple months ago, congratulating him on, on being inducted and, um, you know, asked him if he feels bad that, you know, he came 20 years too early because Daryl could be <laughs> what's going on nowadays real well. Hey, Daryl, he don't, so, hey, don't feel so bad. You were one of many quarterbacks who moved positions. So our, I think our whole team was ex-quarterbacks, right? <laughs> I know that. Daryl, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, where, did you feel like now looking back, do you feel like you were ahead of your time? Yes, I, I do. Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, I enjoyed playing quarterback, but – when I sat down and I thought about it, you know, I, I wanted to continue to play. I had relatives later that I found out, or, uh, the Whittingtons that played with the Raiders and, you know, Super Bowls and were, they were my cousins. And I think Al knew about that. That's why he was watching me. But uh, I, I just felt, you know, uh, that, that was my position, my original position. And, and I, I fought it and fought it because I was having so much success from high school to that point. Uh, I didn't want to do anything but play uh, quarterback. But when I thought about it and the opportunity that I had uh, ahead of me at uh, possibly playing in the National Football League at receiver, uh, I just focused on it. And, and I still remember Coach Gruden telling Walt one day in practice when they moved me to receiver, he, I reminded him of Al Toon. <laughs> you remember that, Walt? That's right. That's right. New York Jets? Yes. Yeah. And that, that's, my, that's my main thing. That, that's what kept me around. Uh, Fred Belitnikoff, who coached me, uh, 
one thing that we had to, I, I could do, I could catch with my, with my hands. I wasn't the fastest, but when you're a Raider, uh, you have to be able to run. Uh, kicker <laughs> to, to, to D-line, O-line. So I knew I could run. I had some 4-2, four, 4-3 four, like Jet and, and uh, Rocket Ismail. But me and Tim Brown, uh, uh, we, we, were, we sort of did the same thing. We could move around from X, Y, and Z. And so uh, I was fortunate. We, we, we were the only two that could really use our hands and, and catch it, and they could kind of move us around in different positions instead of stretching the field. Daryl, I, uh, I have one, and I'll start with you. And this is also for Greg, but I'll start with Daryl since we're already talking to Daryl. Uh, from Troy Kopp, who is here. I see him in the gallery. Uh, he wants to know what – Hey, Troy, I see you. <laughs> Just congratulations to you guys. Uh, what what do you and Greg think of fall camp in '89 with Coach Harris and, and Troy? Said that was a grind and taught him how to grow up quick. Uh, so I'll I'll start with Daryl and then go to Greg. Man, uh, I always tell my my players today they they don't know what camp is. Uh, I mean, man, we used to get uh, two, sometimes three times, uh, but we we had to go and 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 work on our craft uh, and it, it heat, cold, it didn't matter. We, we worked and we worked together as a team and uh, we trust and love each other. And uh, that, that's what I, I, I really, I really uh, miss. Uh, and, and Troy, that, that was my guy, that's my quarterback. He used to always feed me the ball and, <laughs> and I love that guy. And Bishop, Greg Bishop pulling around on, on, on the, the, the talk. Greg, how about you to, to expand on that? You want to talk about fall camp in 1989? Coach Harris had three practices a day. Now, try doing that. Oh, red. Yes. I mean, uh, we're talking uh, morning, and it's not stocked in California, 95 to 105. We're sleeping in these dorms. There's nobody on campus. Um, <laughs> and then at night, he'd have us go out there and do special teams. And I just remember being really, really sore. But – you know, we, like I mentioned earlier, we opened up with Pitt and Auburn, and Auburn was so hot and humid. But when you go three times a day for 15 days, uh, you're prepared. And Coach Harris always had us prepared. He was a detail-oriented person, and um, there was no aspect. And plus, his coaching staff was phenomenal. We haven't got into his coaching staff with – we mentioned John Gruden, but he had Charles Davis and Hugh Jackson and, you know, obviously Ken Blue we talked about a lot. I mean, it was phenomenal time. I enjoyed every minute of just being around those guys, but it was really, really tough. And um, when you practice three times a day in Stockton in August, it's hard. With Coach Cope, the previous years, it wasn't that easy either. And uh, we got a few stories about that, trying to sneak out of the dorms late at night um, using one of the hammocks. But we won't get into that. But Coach Harris did a great job and had us prepared for whatever that season was going to come up with. Sounds like great memories. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. Uh, I'm going to bounce back over to Carl and I have a couple for you, Carl. First of all, the, the draft in 1960, you were taking 22nd overall. What, what was the draft like back then? Can you kind of paint the picture for us? Oh my gosh, this is uh, ancient history. Uh, all I know is that I still had another year to play at Pacific because I had had a logging cap injury, broken hip on the left-hand side mosaic fracture of the left ilium and so I missed that football season it was the very last day of work uh, that this accident happened and so here I am uh, at Pacific wait a minute what's this what's what am I responding to uh, the draft the what yeah, the yeah. draft was like back then <laughs> and so here we are 14 teams in the NFL and uh, I tell the 49ers, or else there are three other teams that ask me, if we draft you, would you play for us? And I said, yes, but here's the condition. Uh, I committed four years of playing football for Pacific. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to honor that last year. And uh, so the 49ers drafted me in that second round, only 14 teams in the NFL in those days, and is the 22nd player taken overall. So hey, I figure that if I had lived up to my draft status, I'd still be playing. <laughs> There's, hey, Taffa reminded me of a story back at Pacific, which is, I think, a cool one to tell. And it's, it's kind of similar. Uh, Coach Myers uh, wanted me to come into his office 
at a precise moment when he was talking with one of the recruits. This is Gary Johnson that came from uh, down in Southern California. And so he talked to his best buddy, uh, Tony Affligate, and Tony committed to Washington State. I love Tony Affligate. I don't mean to cut you up. I work for him and as an intern, great guy. I love him too. So here we are, uh, the discussion between those two guys. And uh, Gary said, well, that's a long drive. I want you to come along. You know, and he says, I'm already committed. He said, yeah, but come on along. So he does come and he's sitting there in the office. And so at the precise moment that Moose wanted me to walk in the door, here I walk in the door. Six foot three, 237 pounds, offensive guard and linebacker. And so Coach Moose stands up and introduces these two guys to me. I didn't know this until uh, about 25 years afterwards when Tony and I are sitting at a dinner with the Moose Myers men. And Tony said, do you know why I came to Pacific? And so he told me this story. And he said, when I saw you walk in through that door, I said, I want to run behind that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Carl, I want to keep it with you. Another question from the gallery for you. Sure. Uh, what was it like to work in the Nixon administration in the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, and how did that come about? I am not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> We're well, not accusing you. Ricky oh, did. Okay. Well, actually, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, handling congressional relations for the Department of uh, Transportation, and as a part of that, I had weekly meetings in the White House with the legislative affairs uh, people and strategizing on this and that and the other thing. And I worked on uh, committees just simply because I was able to get along well with all of the members of Congress, not just a certain party. And uh, I realized that they have a vote. And so by golly, I was able to get uh, passes to the president's box in the Kennedy Center. So I'd invite the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, one of whom happened to be uh, uh, from Stockton, John, John uh, McFall. I invite people to sit in there. And so here's the point of this story. After my telling my, my mother, uh, subsequent to watching uh, the performance in the Kennedy Center. And uh, so I said, now here was Kissinger, here was Halderman. And she said, oh, Carl, you're not involved in all of that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I knew all those uh, people. So uh, I, it was a great awakening for me. And uh, the five other guys that did the same kind of a job uh, those fellows only talk to the Republicans. I talk to everybody. So uh, there's this one member of Congress. Uh, I would meet with him on a Tuesday morning. He was uh, chairman of the Democratic Study Group. We just have a cup of coffee together each Tuesday and chat about stuff. And at one point, uh, he said, Carl, what the F are you doing in the Republican Party? You're such a good guy. <laughs> I said, well, uh, for me, it's a matter of income and outgo. Uh, you know, the, uh, it's a matter of my family has to live on a budget, and uh, I want Congress to live on a budget as well. So that's the, the whole story about the Nixon administration. You can only imagine the, the memories you could, you could pull from the well that time of your life. That's, uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, more from the gallery. Want to go to Coach Harris and to Greg. Uh, from This is from Greg Bishop, and I'll start with Coach Harris. Do you remember when, when you guys played Hawaii in 1989? Remember them throwing the ball late after taking a knee? Uh, I guess you were not happy about that. I wasn't. I went out and asked the head coach what was that all about, and he kind of tried to flip it on me that it was my – my error that could we play so I guess so well to keep it close you know I, it just didn't make a lot of sense so that's all I remember about that. Greg you were mentioning this question too anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah I remember there are two wide receivers um, cutting below the knee on our defensive end toward Dan Hampton's knee up 
So in the fourth quarter, I took one of them out. And there's still video of it somewhere. And uh, I think I broke his jaw and put him out of the game at that point. So I got him back for you, Coach Harris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, question for Daryl. Uh, whose teammate's car did you borrow the most? That is from Jason Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Man, I, I – I came from California with a Datsun 240Z, but I when I, when I left, I had so many vehicles: a, a Dodge Ram, a, a, a Ford Escort. Uh, man, I, I, I borrowed. I, I don't know, man. I had quite a few vehicles. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to go through here. I think that might be the. Uh, oh wait a minute. Uh, this is for for the group, so I'm going to go around the horn. I'll start with uh, I'll start with Daryl since we're here. Uh, best players you played against in college or in pros? Um, I don't know. It doesn't specify. So uh, let's go. Let's go college since it's a specific thing. Oh man! Uh, shoot, let me remember back then. I, I would uh, Fresno State had a cornerback that played, I ended up facing him in the National Football League later on. I can't remember his name. Coach Harris might remember him. Uh, no, I can't remember him. But I knew who you're talking about. Yeah, I can't remember his name, but uh, he, he, was, uh, he was a thorn in my side in college and later on in the pros. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee had a couple of them. I don't remember offhand. Uh, all I remember is Alvin Harper and Chuck Webb and those receivers and stuff that they had over there. Uh, but, uh, you know, pros would probably be Deion Sanders, prime time. Yeah, that'd be That's a good probably one. the best corner. Uh, and and, and all, I, I take that back, Daryl. Daryl Green, I, had a, I was fortunate enough to play <laughs> against Daryl before he retired. Uh, even at an older age, Daryl Green, was, he, was something, he was something special. But uh, we, we practiced against a lot of those guys. With you know the Albert Albert Lewis's, uh, uh, the uh, you know the Raiders. We we had some old old guys that uh, they played for a long time. Uh, we we had a lot of competition during practice. But I would say uh, Daryl Green, Deion Sanders, uh, uh, Steve Atwater, those guys, Junior Seau, those guys, <laughs> they were pretty special. Tafa, how about you? I'd say the guy who really sticks out in my memory uh, was Teddy Bruschi. So Teddy, Teddy was a phenomenal athlete. And I remember the game as if we played it yesterday. We went into Arizona. It was hot. Um, and they were pretty good. They had a pretty stacked team. And I, I thought I, – I, I saw Teddy on, on film. And we, 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 I did a lot of homework watching him. And I thought he was decent. But boy, he was so fast, and his his center of gravity was unlike anyone else. And he wasn't a big guy, uh, but he was just really quick, and he had a motor unlike any other defensive end. I, I've besides Charles Miller, I know C. Miller's on the line here. C. Miller, you always brought the heat in practice, but uh, but no, uh, Teddy Bruschi was definitely the most talented uh, opponent that I, that I faced. Love Teddy Bruschi, one of my all-time favorite players. I'm a Patriots fan, so that uh, yeah, he's got an engine, man. He and he won't quit. He won't quit. You know. So, uh, uh, Greg, how about you? You know, I was always looking at the uh, the opposing defenses. I, I don't know if that's because we watched game tape uh, the, leading up to it or whatever, but I, I remember '87 uh, we played Arizona State, and the I, I would look at the opposing safety. So there was two guys that stuck out. And I'm trying to size myself up against, you know, who the opponent. And there was David Fulcher at DB, who was about 6'3", 225, and just was the most dominant player I ever saw in a college football game. And then Steve Atwater as well in Arkansas in 88. He was just talking so much trash before the game. And he looked at me and says, are you kidding me? You're the safety for the opposing team? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and uh, – those those are the kind of guys that stood out is usually watching the other the other safeties and the other teams. I don't know why I just focused on that, but those were the guys. Carl, how about you? The most memorable player that that uh, or the best player that you played against? Uh, 
I think of three, maybe four people. Uh, first of all, uh, Joe Cap, quarterback for University of California, played a bunch of years in the NFL, and uh, that's one. Arizona State is another one. These guys, let me see, Joe Burton and the other guy's name was Belland, both running backs, and they ran a single wing. <laughs> so here they come again. Uh, you know, that's all they did was uh, run wide sweeps left and right those three. And then finally, the best of all is number 32, Jim Brown. I have a number of pictures of my reaching for him. Uh, I don't have any of my tackling him. <laughs> I feel like there are others that have similar pictures. Yeah. But you you might not be the only one. He's one of those guys that is, uh, you got a pet? Um, so my daughter calling. Oh, you're good. You can, you can take it. I wanted to actually go to Coach Harris and ask Coach gonna, Harris about the, the best gonna, player that you coached against. Uh, well, I, uh, at Tennessee, uh, I would coach against him in practice in spring ball. It was Reggie White. I don't know oh. if I've ever been around a guy who's 6'5", 290. Uh, and the year yeah. I was there was his senior year. So that was before the kids came out early. So he was playing. Um, for a contract, and he, this guy was unbelievable. Um, I, I thought uh, Bo Jackson was unbelievable. Big, burly, you know, they were on the wishbone. Wow, he could fly and run you over. And I'm going to put a plug in for one of the guys that was on our team that I think is one of the great, great individuals, great, great, great player, but a greater person is Larry Fitzgerald. I just think he's a great guy. He, he, the thing I love about Larry, he sets the right example for young kids when he, when the way he plays football. There's no testosterone out there when he's playing. You know, he, he pats the de defenders if they get a good hit or whatever on the butt. He runs back the huddle. He broke, he came in, he, he, the day he got a rec, um, he got second most catches in the history of the NFL was during a two minute drill. He threw the ball, instead of stopping the game, he threw the ball back to the official to, for the two men drill to, to keep going instead of stopping the game to commemorate what he had accomplished. He just, he sets a great example for young people. We're kind of coming around the, uh, the home stretch here. So I'm going to go around the horn and I want to ask each of you uh, what you feel the <laughs> legacy of Pacific football is. And, and I'll start with you, Coach Harris, and I'll, I'll go around the horn. The legacy, I, I just think um, it's, it's the young men that go there that have been overlooked and, or people don't think they're good enough to play at a higher level and they go to Pacific and they got, a, they got, a, they, they got an edge, you know, they got reasons. It's like Tom Brady. Tom Brady's a six-round draft choice. He's pissed off all the time, you know, because – they overlooked him. Richard Sherman, same same deal. He's a fifth year or a fifth round draft choice. I think that Pacific attracted the, the kids. We had very good coaches along. I think that's a big reason why uh, a lot of guys went into coaching. You know, like Bobby Cope, Chester Cat, uh, uh, Buddy Ryan, Ken Blue, you know, Doug Scoville. Uh, we just had a lot of good examples for young kids to uh, try to try to be somebody and um, I, I think they gave us an edge and why we would play so good against so many teams that we were out and over overmatched. Daryl how about you the legacy of Pacific football? Oh man uh, I got like, like Walt said I, I, I went to Pacific yeah I, when I took my scout when I took my uh, recruiting trip I walked through the Hall of Fame uh, I went to the old basketball gym. Uh, Pacific felt home to me. Uh, yeah, I was in California. I didn't have to, to leave state. I could, you know, get back to, to L.A. to my dad if I needed to. But, you know, I went to Pacific because uh, I wanted to show people that I could play football at a D1 school, okay? And uh, I wanted to play against some good competition where people could see me play against the, you know, see my, see my skill and see me play against a D1 competition. And so uh, I did have a chip on my shoulder. I, there's no doubt about it. I had a chip on my shoulder and uh, I wanted to uh, let everyone know 
how special Pacific, how, what special place Pacific was, and and it, uh, it it just it just felt home to me, and 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 I'm really appreciative for the opportunity to be able to uh, say that I'm a UOP Tiger. I love it. Well said. Well said. Greg, you're up. You're up next, man. Oh, okay. Well, you gotta you gotta ask yourself why you went there in the first place to Pacific. It was a small school. You had uh, 20 people in your classroom. Uh, and you really made some close friendships that lasted forever. So um, that's the legacy of Pacific football right there. Tafa? I, I have to agree with, with Greg. You know, one of the reasons I, I picked Pacific was, you know, the, the curriculum and the courses. Uh, honestly, football was second for me. I was a late start with football. I, I only played two years before I, I showed up at Pacific. So I was, I was a basketball player. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it's just the, the relationships, the friendships, and, and the memories. And where else could you go to a private school in California, you know, 3,000, 3,500 student population, and face teams like Nebraska, you know, who's back-to-back -back national champs, and, and go out there and, 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 and try to compete. So for me, it was like I can go and, and be kind of showcase my skill sets like, like Daryl had mentioned at a small school. And if I get picked up, I get picked up. Worst case scenario, I'll get a great education. And so uh, for me, that, that, that's, that's what I uh, really value and cherish about Pacific. So, Hey, Zach, I want to say one more thing. Um, sure. The coaches we had there, one of them's on here. We had uh, – that's the le also a legacy of Pacific is the amazing coaches. We got on into it briefly, but I mean, think about the, the coaches that went through that program with uh, Bob Cope and all the guys on Walt Harris's staff all the way through to the Buddy Ryan days. And, you know, they're making movies about this right now with, uh, you know, Stripes of the Tiger. And where else are you going to find a school that has a defunct sports program that has a on Facebook page. So, you know, we're still going and we got it going. And that's, that's the legacy we're trying to keep. Actually, before I get to Carl, who's going to wrap it up with his, uh, with his legacy question uh, or, or comments, uh, Greg, I did have a question for you that we could sneak in since you brought it up. Uh, what memories do you have of coach Cope? That was a question from the, from the gallery. Uh, just uh, like a father figure kind of guy, you know, you talk to your family, put your arm around you. I have a hard time talking about that. Great guy. Yeah. Awesome. Love him. Uh, Carl, we're gonna we're gonna close with you and, and your uh, your thoughts on on what is the legacy of Pacific football. All right, before I get to that, I'm gonna follow on in my comment to Jim Brown. Uh, yes, he was he was the Tiger Woods of his generation. Uh, we have he's on the twenty yard line catches a screen pass. I missed the tackle on the sideline. Eddie Dove, 49ers, of course, in my rookie year. The 49ers uh, defensive back, Eddie Dove, was on the track team at Denver. And uh, he is two steps behind Jim Brown. Jim Brown was 230 pounds, and Eddie Dove was 167 pounds. Here they go. All the 80 yards, uh, Eddie Dove does not gain on him. That's unfair, you know? And so that's the kind of guy he was. He was able to go around you, over you, through you. Uh, we mentioned before, I did, uh, Tom Flores. Tom, if my recollection is correct, was the first Division I minority quarterback uh, in, the, in the Division I there. And he was, his backup was uh, Junior Reynoso. Now, the, the story about... Uh, uh, memories at Pacific. Oh, I didn't do that. I'm going to conclude by saying the most memorable in the NFL was 1966, where in a 14 game season, I had, and this is not necessarily bragging, just keeping the facts straight. You can brag, it's okay. <laughs> the, I had 16 and a half quarterback sacks in 1966, old defensive right end for the Skins. Great memory. And the relationships are all the same. Great uh, friendships and continue to be in contact with the NFL guys and my football players and all students at Pacific. Uh, my roommates in, at Delta Upsilon were Don Smith. He was all American water polo player. 
uh, Gary Brink was a basketball player, uh, and uh, Jerry Johnson was an All-American drinker, and myself, and we're all still in touch with one another today. I stay at uh, Don Smith's house when I come into Lodi and Stockton, and Smitty says, uh, your credit card is still on record here, so come on down. <laughs> Well, I, I just, I just want to say what a, what a pleasure it was. This was a, a privilege for me to, to sit with you guys and, and to host this and to, to help you lather up some memories. And I, I get excited just thinking about what, what you guys had gone through at Pacific. And I love hearing the old Pacific football stories and, and try and incorporate them whenever I can, whenever I'm, I'm out with Pacific. So thank you guys for sharing. Uh, thank you for being here. And, and thank you for all you've done since leaving Pacific. Really, you guys are are the class of, of the university, even though the, pro, the program doesn't exist anymore, uh, you guys are still very much beloved and you, you should all know that. You have a proud, uh, proud history of Pacific. Um, I want to, before I go, say that next week, we are going to, in this space, take a look back at Pacific Volleyball, teams that won back-to-back -back national championships, 1985 and 1986. Former head coach John Dunning will be here. Uh, Therese Boyle, Elena Oden, and Mary Trebet. So that is what is going to happen here next week from four to five. Uh, so uh, look out for that link and we hope to see you all here again next week. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, football, uh, thank you so much for being here, guys. Appreciate it. Great job, Zach. Thanks for having us. Way to go. Good job. Thank Good you. job, you guys. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Hey, Tigers. See you guys. Thank it was you. awesome. See you later. See you, Greg. See you, Coach Harris. Hi, Coach. Bye, Greg. See you, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. Hey, Coach. Oh, All right. I'll talk to you later. See you, Carl. <laughs> See you, Zach. Anybody recognize that? Guys.